I'm here with my friend, Joel Cohen. Now, I'm not actually here. I'm in Italy, and he's in his apartment in Paris, but I'm delighted to see my good old friend, Joel. And um, many of you will know him. Everybody here will know Joel Cohen. He's been active on the scene in Boston, in North America, in the world for many, many years. For 40 years, I think, he was the artistic director of the Boston Camerata, which had and still has under its new director, An Azima, an amazing career spanning a half a century, I guess, just about now. Anyhow. Since, 50, Joel, since 54, but I, yeah. I, that was well, when it actually started. So Anyhow, it's uh, terrific to see Joel, and I'm delighted to have you here or there or whatever it is. Anyway, uh, us talking together after such a long time. Joel, tell me a little bit about how you started off as a musician. It's always interesting to me how you started as a musician and how did you get into the area of music that we now call early music or historical performance or whatever? Um, I was passionately motivated by music uh, starting in my adolescence. I went to a music camp at the University of Rhode Island and uh, had been playing classical guitar and then uh, the orchestra leader put, put me on to double bass, which has the same tuning on the four lower strings. And uh, I just, it, it became really, really a, my, my mission or my calling. Uh, my, my first introduction to early music was in the uh, a cappella choir of classical high school in Providence, Rhode Island. And Dr. Louis oh. McSheary, who was a blessed memory, who was a great enthusiastic guy, had us sing madrigals from the a cappella songbook of Hugh Clawton Lester. I remember it's a great book, wasn't it? That yeah. was the month of May, Matona Mia Cara, with a totally sanitized translation because it's a very yeah. obscene lyric, all kinds of stuff. And yeah. I thought that was sweet, but it was sort of in the periphery of my consciousness until I guess it was my junior year uh, at Brown University. And there was a chairman music series there, which, had, which was of very good quality. And I walked down the hill to the Rhode Island School of Design Auditorium, and there was the New York Pro Musica. Uh -huh. And uh, there was Russell Oberlin and Charles Bressler uh, singing, uh, let me think, was it Rio Rio Chiu or something like that? It was a Spanish <laughs> Renaissance program. And uh, the, the Oberlin and Bressler, by the way, Oberlin wrote to me shortly before his death. And I, I still have the letter, but it, it 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 lifted me out of my chair. And I said, "Oh, I want to do this stuff." So I mean, yeah. started in my junior year of college. That's great. I don't know if you knew of it as as early music or what. What what what, what did you think it was when you what you just called this stuff? Well, it was Renaissance music. Was did I call it early music or Renaissance music? I don't know. But uh, uh, I think the New York Pro Musica built itself, built itself as an early music group. And they had a number of programs in repertory. That's Spanish one. They had some English repertoire. They had a Monteverdi program. And I sort of hung out a lot with Noah Greenberg, uh, whom I felt was a you know, very good leader. And uh, uh, he was an interesting man. He was totally self-educated. He had been a labor union organizer, a former lefty. Uh, so that ties in with your find your own, do your own thing thing uh, yeah. bit. And we would we would spend hours just talking about uh, life and music and so forth. So that was the, I would say Greenberg was my big model, and uh, I guess I called it Renaissance music because they they only the only medieval program I knew about about in their repertoire was play of Daniel. I never saw that production. But I didn't do a number. I did came to a number of their of their Renaissance programs, and I found them quite thrilling. Of course, one listens to them now, and approaches have changed. But at that time, I found it intensely motivating. Yeah, absolutely, and they were sort of the only game in town at that time. I mean, well, that was it, and of course, the idea of uh, the 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 fo my focus is on repertoire. There, this there hadn't been. Uh, at that point, really, the revolution in Baroque performance practice, or perhaps it was just starting in Europe, it had, it had not hit the shores of the United States. So maybe um, Leonhardt was recording, uh, I think his first recording of the Well-Tempered Clavier was on a 
a very modern sounding harpsichord, you know, he, he had still not gotten into the, so it was there, so it wasn't a question of doing, uh, doing Telemann or Bach or, or Haydn a certain way. For me, it was a question of a whole new area of, of repertoire. So, of course, you were listening. You're talking to what a wonderful thing to have spent that time in Greenberg and to listen to the pro musica. But how did you get started then as a performer? I think of you as one of the early members of the uh, Boston of the Boston Camerata, which it, uh, I think had its origin in the Museum of Fine Arts, Boston. Is that right? That's right. That's right. It had been founded in 54 by the great Narcissa Williamson. I say great because she was spiritually great. She wasn't a virtuoso player. She was the keeper of the of the very distinguished yeah. musical instruments collection there, right? And along yeah. with her, there was uh, Anne Gombogie, who was uh, the widow of the great musicologist Otto Gombogie. I was strongly influenced by Gombogie as a scholar because he applied principles of music criticism to the to the lute pieces he was discussing, and uh, he discussed them as you would discuss any other piece. And uh, the, the, the tenor of scholarship at that point, at least at Harvard, uh, where I went after, after my undergraduate, it was, was, was very much musical paleography and uh, listing concordances and so forth. And, and Gombos, you would discuss a piece as a piece. I thought that was, I thought that was, was quite magnificent. <laughs> and you know, Anne Gombos, was a co-founder of the Camerata. I, I knew her, I worked with her as a, with a school pedagogical school concert group. And those are my early Boston models. I met the Thonunis. They were in the, uh, uh, they were in the camera. Judy Davidoff had left. She went to, uh, she went to the Nyonki Musica. But Friedrich and Inga were in, were, were in that. And uh, Friedrich, Friedrich von Huna, the great, the, the great recorder great, maker. Yeah, the great recorder Friedrich, maker. Yeah. And it isn't as well known as that he just loved to play. And he had a distinctively personal sound and a kind of drive in his playing that I found quite admirable. Of course, he revolutionized an aspect of, um, of instrument making as well. And uh, Inga Thonhuno, who was playing recorders and gamba, and they, they were lifelong friends. They, 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 they'd been lifelong friends. Yeah. And so then the, the, the Boston Camerata, it was called that, but it was based Boston at the Museum Camerata of Camerata of the Museum of Fine Arts, Boston. I shortened there the name, you know. said, you can't fly with that. Yeah, so I had uh -huh. started directing it, but then the museum didn't like that. But I think, look, you've got, we've got to exist. Well, uh, ultimately, the uh, ultimately the what was original, what the Camerata of the Museum of Fine Arts, comma Boston, became mm -hmm. the Boston the Camerata, Camerata and became a right. kind of an in an independent group under your direction. Is that right? We left the museum in uh, the '74, and uh, got incorporated as a nonprofit. We had some very fine people help us set up a board and and steer the business end of it. Yeah, that was when. Well, I remember, I remember when I was a student going to, going to your concerts uh, in, in Sanders Theater, and I know you had a regular season in Boston. You began to do a little bit of touring. What I remember is that you did a great variety of different kinds of music. I mean, you did Dido and Aeneas. You did, ultimately, you did a beautiful play of Daniel. And right. in between, you did lots and lots of Renaissance music, Proctorius programs, all mm -hmm. sorts of things. And so I presume right. it means that you must have had a somewhat flexible roster of uh, performers. Yeah, well, there were, there, there was a, at the beginning, there was a, there was a group of, a, a, a largish group of, of regulars who appeared all the time. And then uh, as, 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 as we evolved, I decided I really need to bring in specialists in this repertoire, that repertoire. That led to a fair amount of friction. Some people said, no, you need to have this person being in everything. Finally, it, it, it was resolved in favor of, uh, in favor of the, uh, the more flexible roster. But in terms of the choices of repertoire, yeah, it, it shows our history. Uh, rooted in the United States of America rather than in Europe. Uh, so you don't get a government sub subsidy. Uh, you don't get a mi culture ministry who gives you a medal and pins it on your chest. So we were, we were doing, um, uh, yes, yeah, so a wide variety of repertoire uh, because we're in the marketplace. And we needed right. to. Uh, you had to come up with a Christmas concert every year, and so on. Well, yeah, that started. The Christmas concerts actually are still are still going strong. I just finished the Christmas CD about four days ago. 
<laughs> which uses a lot of the material from the 1974 medieval yeah. Christmas, the bones display and stuff like that. So it's still going strong, and people still get a lot out of that, you know. Yeah. So that's fine. Yeah. And it, if you look at the medieval uh, source list, a, a lot of most of the San Marcelo repertoire, for instance, is, at least half of it is Christmas. So there you go. There's, yeah, yeah. There was always a sense of the specialness of Christmas. But yes, so we have we were a non-specialist special ensemble, specialist ensemble. I say we, but I'm still very much involved in, in camera planning, even though on directs uh, the concerts. And um, and that's uh, that's at once a great strength. It's given us a different perspective than a specialist ensemble that will only only perform 17th century on the ensemble right. yeah. or, or wind music from this period and so forth and so forth. It's been a great strength and it's, uh, uh, it's also put us at odds at times uh, with, with, with part, of the, uh, part of the current. And fact, frankly, I, uh, I, were, were it mine to, to do over, we would, I think I would have made largely the same thing. Uh huh. Well, it's the it's the age old difference between specialists and generalists, and the specialist is narrow and focused, and the generalist is broad and open, and you got to take your pick. Um, well, as I, as, let me let me just add to that. that. As the years went on, I did start to focus on certain areas of repertoire, which seemed to yes. mean a lot to me. You talked about the East West thing and uh, Middle Eastern music. Yeah. Uh, uh, medieval music has become became very important to me. Uh, uh, recordings of troubadour songs and troubadour songs, uh, the, and then the whole Americana thing, which began really in 1976. I was going to say that one of the things that you and others, but I mean, I think of you as the spearhead of this, is interest in other repertories that are in some way either spiritually or 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 performatively or somehow allied with early music, things like Shaker hymnody, early New England hymnody, um, uh, shape note singing, and you've, you've got involved in all of those kind of aspects of American culture that are typically American, right? Well, I would say that the common thread, because we've also applied the same methods to, uh, uh, to Cantigas using a Moroccan ensemble uh, to, to accompany the singing and so forth. The, 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 the common thread is an interest, of, I like to say passion interest in this, this frontier area between so-called learned music and so-called popular music. And then there's this thin line and where do you cross it? And I think that's, uh, that, that's very, very important to me as a researcher and to me as someone who just enjoys also listening and performing. So across the different repertoires, uh, that's been something that's that's been consistent, and it really it goes back years and years to the early days of Camerata. Well, I do remember. Didn't you actually spend some time with the Sabbath Day Lake Shakers in Maine? And actually, I mean, you were not you were not just being kind of an outside observer taking a snapshot of the of the Indians in their headdresses. You were actually trying to figure out how this music worked in the world in which it played an important role. Well, if, if you look at if you look at the the, the repertoires we've done, we very often called on uh, collaborators or or participating ensembles. And Anne continues that. And she did a, a, a Hispanic Christmas a year and a half ago. Uh, she had a bunch of kids from Everett, Massachusetts, who were in a choir. They're from Guatemala, and Mexico, and uh, and they they sang yeah. along with the camarada, and then they sang in Nahuatl and and so forth. So uh, give me the question again, because I lost the thread. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to think something, uh, something about uh, uh, active engagement with the music yeah. rather than looking sure. at it as a museum object. And I was using the Sabbath day experience as an example. Sabbath day is very interesting because the way, the way it happened was, uh, I was told by Roger Hall, who's a Shaker music specialist, that there was a great, terrific archive in Sabbath Day Lake, Sabbath Day Lake, Maine, about an hour north of, of Portland. And so I called as a professional librarian there and I said, I'd like to use the archive, may I consult your things? Because the shaky music is written 90% of it in this sort of in what they call literal notation. It's like root tablature. So you have to decipher that. Uh, they, I came up there 
and uh, I was work. I was plugging away uh, in in the uh, in the library, and then the leader of the Sheikha community said, "Would you like to come to lunch?" She came over because they had heard Camarada on the radio. They listened to Chile. <laughs> And so uh, we became we began a friendship that way, uh, discussing uh, discussing music and life and so forth. And they gave me the run of their they gave me the run of their archives. And let's see, there's now two two in a fraction uh, uh, CD programs plus the stage pro stage stage work called Borrowed Light, built on my basically on on my research. Also, Anne Helka did quite a bit of it. I've uh, built on the research in the Shaker Library using, in the main, unpublished, unpublished manuscript sources. So that's been an enormous, uh, an enormous part uh, that 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 sense of discovery, working with original sources, and I, I'm, I'm very delighted that uh, that we're living in North America, and that this is an it's a relatively unknown to the outside world. You know the Shakers had nothing to do with the, the wider world. And yet there are this, there's this music, it's mainly modal. Uh, it's uh, very related to British Isles folk song, yet it's written down, it's art song. And, um, and a lot of it is just beautiful music. Absolutely beautiful. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's better known now than it used to be, thanks to you. Let me, let me switch gears just a second, because one of the interesting things that you said earlier was that we, you did, uh, what did you, I don't know how you said it, not like we're a commercial organization or we've got to sell tickets or something or that you had to think a bit about your audience. Yes. You went through what, what I think of as the long period in which recording contracts made a huge difference right. to American professional ensembles. It used to be the model yeah. was you start a local series, you get a local audience, and then you go to New York, you get a, you give a performance in New York, you hope to get a review in the New York Times, they'll get you a recording contract, and then you're then you're on easy street. And you're made well, in the shade, those, as they say, right, yeah. That kind of, those were great days and the, that world has changed, but what was it like for you? I mean, you made a very large number of really influential recordings. I don't know whether you got rich over them. You look, you look like you're sitting there in the lap of luxury, Joe. I'd say so it's, I it's really great. I'm going to have a sandwich at noon. You know, it's I can barely wait. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, the recording certainly was helpful. Uh, we were lucky to uh, to make contact. Well, my first recordings were made with George de Mendelssohn Bartholdi, mm -hmm. legend in the world of recorded sound because he had Vox and the Vox boxes and so forth. And the Vox boxes, I remember. I did all those for a pittance. And uh, I, see, I still see them turning up on Spotify. Uh, I don't particularly want to see them anymore, but they're, they're around. Mm -hmm. And, um, but then we had, uh, we had the for good fortune to uh, attract the attention of Nonsuch Records with Tracy Stern in those days. And she was a big, big boost. And then as the American recording industry basically petered out in terms of classical music, same thing happened with the big boys like the Boston Symphony and so forth. The European, the European labels took up the slack. So we recorded with, uh, still recording with Harmonia Mundi because the new, the new uh, tapes that Anne has just finished are, will be out in Harmonia Mundi in a few months. And there was mm -hmm. Telefunk and uh, uh, Arado for a long time. Uh, we, I must have made 10 or 12 CDs for Arado, you know? So that's, that was, yes, it was very helpful. And uh, in a sense, you know, I'm, I still think there's nothing like a live performance. It's, it's totally- I couldn't, yeah. But the, 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 the recorded sound and now the, the video products that Han has been producing, they do leave a trace afterwards. So for instance, uh, uh, Camerata recorded the Dido and Aeneas production that Han, Han conceived uh, during the during the epidemic during the COVID. It was in November of last year, and then at the time of the early music festival, uh, 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 Camerata upped the thing again on uh, on uh, on the internet so people could buy tickets for it. So it's good to, it's good to have those things. Yes. Yeah, but how do you? And also, yeah. Oh, go ahead, okay, go ahead. please. Uh, 
All right. Well, the thing is that that's, it's nice to have it's nice to have the um, it's nice to have the record of what one has done. I must say, it's uh, uh, you can listen to an old tape and then wince, and then you can listen to an old tape and say, "Well, that's right." You know, there's some insight into that. You know, so <laughs> works both uh, What do you what do you think? I mean, nobody can predict the future. Um, but surely the future in many ways is going to be uh, different from the past, at least for professional musicians. And if you were, if you were a professional, an up and coming, really dedicated uh, practitioner of early music of some kind nowadays, what do you think the future for such a person would be like? Oh my God, that's a very scary question. Yeah, I know. And I'm certainly full of admiration for the young people who choose early music repertoire as a métier. And I must say, as I survey the classical music field in general, I think standards are a lot higher than when I was a student. You I know, agree. let's let's leave the early music field entirely. I used to go to uh, concerts as an undergraduate and, and at Brown, I would go down to the the Auditorium, the Veterans Auditorium, and I'd hear orchestras. And I, but I feel now that the level of orchestra playing, as I catch it often on on the stream concerts, or there's a German channel called Takt Eins. I think, my God, there's there's some good playing. I remember I was a kid, and my family subscribed to these 99 cent 10 inch LPs, and there was a group called there's an orchestra called the Zurich Tonhalle Orchestra, and they played. They made some pretty sloppy recordings. For 99 cents so what are you gonna I can't argue with it but now they're on the tv and they're good so standards have gone up all over the place i mean that's all good at the same time there is a big cultural crisis uh does the past have a future which is i said that in a, that wrote a long time ago and it's not simply an early music question it's, it's will there will mozart and guillaume de machot uh, and Bernard de Winterdur and Brahms uh, still be there uh, in a meaningful way. And I, I don't have the answer to that. I think there are many uh, disturbing signs. Uh, at the same time, I see, uh, I see younger generations of performers coming up, very gifted and very devoted. And also the media allows you to access a concert in Cologne or in, uh, or in Zurich very easily. So. I don't have the answer. It's hard to know. I mean, in, on, on the one hand, it's very, very good that the world has become so inclusive and that we're able to listen to any music from any culture without privileging one over the other. So it's great. We have a smorgasbord that we never had before. And at the same time, the explosion in the media makes it possible in a way for everything to be out there. So all we need to hope yep. is, I mean, it's probably reasonable to think that our little part of the musical universe will continue to be small and probably be smaller as the universe expands. The only, the only thing to hope for is that the universe will expand fast enough to accommodate all these wonderful young musicians who are coming along. You know, I also, I also, I, my answer is the one I've had for years. People say, have you heard this group? They're so hot and this group is doing the complete machin uh, so forth and so on. And I'll say, look, I got my own project, and uh, the Camrat has its own projects, and we find we find people who want them and who who, uh, who who adhere to what we do. As long as you have that small small community of people who who respect and admire uh, the same things you do, you're okay. And uh, I let the wide world go on. But I must say, the wide world isn't the wild world isn't a difficult a difficult task right now so it's certainly a, it's certainly a matter of concern well what i think i hear you saying is um be enthusiastic about something and take that seriously and devil take the hindmost i mean what uh, that seems to be the way to go forward is to do what you love I, I don't know i don't know how to give advice to third parties i certainly have always followed my own passions so for instance as you say this this constant exploration of popularizing art music or art or, or pop music that has an art type art type form that's been a constant in my life and I've, I've i've steered the musical programs to things that i've really cared very much about now 
Can you institutionalize that? I really don't know. Uh, but I, I consider myself very lucky uh, that, uh, you know, well, for 40 years I ran Camerata and then I'm still doing performing and have interesting number. I, admit, I can tell you about the, the, the upcoming project in the fall uh, of, of Americana for Camerata. It's been, it's been uh, circulating in my brain for weeks and weeks, you know. So it's great to have new things that are, that are, that are there for you. Is that a solution for everybody? I can't say. For me, I, I, I consider myself fortunate. Parentheses. Uh, in the upcoming November concert for Camerata, uh, we're using some of the oldest sources of Afri African American song. Uh, the first book that that's no where the tunes are notated by by Black Americans uh, from the 1870s, and the, the 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 two people who put the notation down were former slaves, and they had. Uh, a concept of musical notation, but it wasn't complete. So the work we're doing now, try to reconstitute, reconstitute the melodies from that period, is very much like the work uh, I've done and Anne has done on Troubadour song. You know, where <laughs> right. you, you have a line and where the, the rhythms aren't there, and yeah, what do you do with that? So uh, I find myself using the same skills uh, that that have been very useful in, in the medieval field in music that's quite close to us in time. And it's absolutely, it's absolutely fascinating things, things that come up. Well, I look forward to it. And it's great to see that you operate with the same skills and the same enthusiasm that have kind of enriched the early music world for the last, gosh, I hate to say how long. So I don't know, Joel, I think it's a, a wonderful thing. Any, any parting thoughts from you? Sounds as though you, you had to, uh, a pronouncement to make. Pronounce. Oh, yeah, yeah, let's say the old man of the mountain. No, forget it. I'm, although I am on a hill right now, it's my mind. Uh, but I, I would like to say that the, 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 uh, the, the danger in coursework or academic work, this isn't just the music field. Uh, you can talk about philosophy or literature, so forth. You know, there's a danger of over specialization, and specialization is fun. You drill down deep into a subject and you find so many things, but the danger is that you you shut out the the wider world, and the, you, that we, even within your specialty, uh, you don't see the things that that tie all this stuff together. You know. Uh, another one of the uh, another one of the things that's going to be coming up in the November concert, since I'm plugging that, uh, is the use of a melodic motif uh, in both black spirituals and white spirituals, deriving from a medieval chant. It's called Udici Sinium, uh, and uh, I, I actually gave a paper on this at the University of Oregon a couple a couple of years back. But you did see Sinium, which is still saw variants of it, still sung in Catalonia and on Mallorca, so forth. Some it jumped the shark somewhere, and there are English language variants of it as well. And uh, and so it's fans fascinating to see things, something coming down from the 12th century, being recorded, of course, in much different form by Nina Simone about 20 years ago. So there you are. <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> Well, you do, you do manage somehow to connect all of music and all of art together. It's a great skill you have. And thank you for sharing it with us, Joel Cohen. It's been a thank great you very much. This conversation. Thanks. It's a pleasure. Take care, Tom. Enjoy Italy. The Guidonian hand says hello. Absolutely.